Forge from Iron is proud to support Iron Supporting Food Banks. They are a group of West Ham United fans and friends inspired by the work of other football fan food banks around the country. They collect food and cash donations from Newham Food Bank in Beckton, who supply seven distribution centres in the borough, seven days a week, and hand out several hundred three-day emergency food packs every month to families in need. They are also working with other groups to improve conditions for vulnerable adults and children in the Newham community. They are supported in their efforts by West Ham United Football Club, the WHU Foundation, LS185, London Legacy Development Corporation, Newham Council, the Met Police, Spire London East Hospital, Expedient Security and a large number of West Ham and football fans. You can help by making a donation to their Just Giving page. You will find the link to this in the description section of the video details in this stream. Thank you for your support. Come on you irons. morning and welcome to Forge from Iron. This 9.30, 9.34 actually, on Saturday the 15th of April. Okay, please don't forget to like, comment on and share this stream to your social media platform. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Make sure you hit the bell icon for alerts on new content. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you very much indeed for your support in this matter. We are here to discuss Premier League match day 30 of 38. We're now getting really into the home straight now. And it's a London derby taking place tomorrow afternoon at the London Stadium. West Ham United will be facing our cross-city rivals, Arsenal. And this is, if for anyone that's interested, the list of the officials. They are David Coote with the referee's whistle. His assistants will be Lee Betts and Timothy Wood. The full official will be Stuart Atwell. John Brooks is on VAR duty and Sean Massey Ellis is his assistant. Before we get sort of too far into it, Dukes a little bit had a little bit of a situation going on at the at the Lewisham Tavern and, and things require his attention, him being the, the manager there. So apologies from Duke. He won't be around for this one unless he, he drops in very late doors. But I, I don't don't think he will be, but you know, it is what it is. We'll just sort of crack on with it anyway. So look, I'm not going to labour the point too much. I mean, for those of you that watched yesterday's review of the the Ghent game, I think this is this is going to be a really tough game. If I'm being brutally honest, and I like to try and think of myself as, as someone that's usually quite positive, tries to be someone that's glass half full rather than glass half empty a lot of the time. I, I think we're up against it here. I really do. I just look at the way we've been playing. I look at our general style of football, our general attitude, our application. And I just look at Arsenal and I, I just go, that that is not going to end well. Now, whether it's going to be on the same sort of level as a, as a Brighton away or a Newcastle at home, that sort of kicking, maybe not. I think possibly... The fact that it's a London derby might bring that little bit extra out in the West Ham players that maybe we haven't seen an awful lot this season. But I don't think it's going to make any fundamental difference to the outcome. I'll, I'll be completely honest. I think that if, if we got away with a draw, that would be a magnificent result. I can't even see that. I really can't. I know that we discussed it yesterday and Duke referenced the point about if there's a team that likes to spoil the party, of a, of a team going for the title. We have something of a history of doing this. Go back to season 91-92. We were getting relegated and we played Manchester United who were going for the title 
with Leeds United, the last ever season of the old football league before the Premier League came into being. And we played Manchester United at London, at London Stadium, at Upton Park, bowling ground. Kenny Brown in the second half hits this ball past Peter Schmeichel, derails Alex Ferguson's championship charge and Leeds United went on to win the title. We then did it a couple of years later. Same place, same opposition. Last day of the season. We didn't get relegated in this season, but we derailed Manchester United's party to winning the Premier League as it was then. And it went to Blackburn Rovers who lifted the trophy at Anfield. And then obviously a couple of years ago, the first season at London Stadium, we obviously got a result against Tottenham Hotspur, which was crucial in denying them the Premier League title and sending it to Leicester City. All that being said, that's in the past. This is now. And I just look at the way that the two teams are playing. And, and also, don't forget that Arsenal have an, an advantage over us in the fact that we played a game on Thursday evening. They've had a whole week to rest, to recuperate, to do their, their due diligence on us, which won't be very difficult, let's be completely honest, and to really sort of get themselves up to speed and, and get the best out of themselves for the game at London Stadium tomorrow. I don't, like I say, I, I regrettably don't see any other outcome than an Arsenal victory, but we'll see what happens. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a game of football. It depends. You know, you could have a contentious decision by the officials. You could have a penalty given. You could have a player sent off. Anything can happen that might affect the outcome one way or the other. Anyway, I'm just going to go into the team news now. So obviously there was this thing yesterday about this, this news and it wasn't a surprise to me. I've done about you guys. Jan Lucas Gamaka now is set to miss the Arsenal visit, and it looks like he might even miss the rest of the season because of this knee injury, which was said that, oh, it probably won't need surgery. You know, it'll probably be a couple of weeks, this, that, and the other. Now, all of a sudden, they're turning around and saying, yep, it needs surgery, and he's, you're probably not going to see him again this season. Well, newsflash, I could see this one coming. I really could, and I'm pretty sure that most people could as well. It was... It, it just smacks to me that basically he and David Moyes, in my opinion, it looks to me, looking from the outside, looking in that particular direction, that David Moyes and Gianluca Scamacca have had a complete breakdown in their relationship. And I don't blame Gianluca Scamacca from what I can see. It just looks to me like he's been he's been signed on the basis of his impression of how he's going to be utilised and all the rest of it. And then he's walked through the door and it's not quite been what he signed up to. There was obviously then, I think, the straw that broke the camel's back from what I can see was the the, the Aston Villa game, I think it was, where it looked like he was going to come on as a substitute. He was all ready to come up and then it was like, right, OK, you go and sit back down. And there was that photograph of him on the advertising hoardings or in front of the advertising hoardings looking thoroughly pissed off. And... I wouldn't be surprised if that was the moment where he went, I've got to get the fuck out of this place. And I don't blame him. I mean, the geese has been played. When he's played, he's, he's pretty much been played as a lone striker. He never played as a lone striker, to the best of my knowledge, when he was at Sassuolo. He was played in a two. He was played in a three. Berardi and Raspadori, either side of him, usually. And that's how you get the best out of him. I mean, that's what we've signed him on the basis of his performances playing in that sort of role. And then we put, put him into a role that he didn't play in that season. Makes no sense to me. Uh, but David Moyes has got a little bit of form for this, hasn't he? I think we've seen the last of Jan Lucas Kamaka in a claret and blue shirt. I really do. And that really does make me angry because Number one, I think he's a very talented footballer. If you can set the team up around him to play to his strengths, to get the best out of him, I think you've got yourself a really good striker. As I say, as I said yesterday, a couple of seasons ago, there were three strikers, up and coming strikers in Europe that everybody was looking at and thinking, oh, they could they could be someone to watch. And they were Erling Haaland, Darwin Nunez and Gian Lucas Kamaka. Now, one of them went to Man City, obviously, in, in Holland, and he's ripped it up. 
Darwin Nunez, all right, maybe not at the same level as Haaland, but let's be completely honest, who has been on that level this season. But he's done reasonably well. He's still getting to grips with the Premier League. He's getting grips to his role at Liverpool Football Club. But you look at him and you you see that he's got a manager that's tr- that is is believing in him. That is that he's got the team set up in a way that gets the very best out of him. And then there's Gianluca Scamacca under David Moyes at West Ham United, and it's not quite the same, is it? So he's he's got pissed off and he's just he's like oh, I'm out of here. He, he's very likely back in Italy. I, I don't believe this about this. He's got a problem with his knee. I think that's a cover story. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying I'm in the know or anything. I just think that I could see this coming down the track. And so it's proved. He, he, I, I don't think he's got anything wrong with him. I think this is a cover story. I think in the summer he'll be gone. I think the only way that Jan Lucas Kamaka is a West Ham player next season is if David Moyes isn't one or the other. And it may even be that maybe the damage is done. And even if David Moyes isn't the West Ham manager next season, that maybe Gian Lucas Gamaka is like, sorry, mate, I, I can't be having this. I, I'm I'm off. So we'll wait and see. Um, as far as any other team news, I'm just looking here uh, on Sports Mole as my resource. It looks like as far as the starting 11 is concerned, Lucas Fabianski is very likely going to be coming back in goal for Alphonse Areola. So he'll be going against his, his former club. Um, just looking here, any news about any knocks? Um, it says here, Thomas Socek, Kurt Zuma, Mikhail Antonio and Lucas Paketar. They all obviously missed the Craven Cottage match. Um, they're all looking to come back in to, to the possibly the starting 11. Personally, I'd like to see Thomas Socek kept well out of it. I don't not quite sure that he's going to add an awful lot to the team, in my opinion. But then the question is, who would replace him? So, um, but Lucas Paquetá, I mean, again, I said this yesterday. It, I think it was 16 minutes he was on the pitch against Ghent, and he was probably a contender for man of the match. He was getting the ball. He was he was trying to move it forwards. All right, they didn't all come off, but he was trying to play the forward pass. He was trying to spot the runners, making the runs in behind, making things happen. He obviously then had the, the opportunity in the latter stages of the match when the referee gave a foul, gave a red card incorrectly. Not a problem. The, the red card was overturned and I completely agree with that. I thought it was a cracking challenge. Um, but I think Lucas Paqueta needs to needs to start if, if we're going to have any sort of attacking impetus. Because uh, he showed in the 16 minutes, and all right, Ghent are not on the same level as Arsenal. I get that. But I think it's just what he can add to the team going forwards. Um, as far as the Arsenal team is concerned, uh, Mikel Arteta has apparently ruled out William Saliba with a back injury. And he says he might not return to full fitness for a few weeks, which is obviously good news for us, not good news for, for Arsenal Football Club in what remains of the Premier League season. Obviously, as things stand at the moment, the situation is they've played 30 games and they have 73 points with a goal difference of plus 43. Manchester City, who are hot on their heels, have played 29 matches, 67 points. So obviously they've got a game in hand and their goal difference is 48. So basically the brass tacks of the situation is if Manchester City win their game in hand, that will take them on to 73 points. And then there's the game at the Etihad Manchester City v Arsenal. And you'd like to think that's probably going to be the title decider. I think if Arsenal can go to the Etihad and at least get a point, I think it's very likely they win the Premier League. If Manchester City do it, then obviously they will then go ahead of them on goal difference. By that stage, you'd have thought that would still be an advantage that they have over Arsenal. And I think that from that point on, the momentum would be completely with Manchester City. And it would it would very be the experience, it would be the depth in the squad, I think, that probably would see them home. But it's still very, very tight to call. Anyway, so just going further on, it looks like uh, Rob Holding will keep his place in the Arsenal eleven, And it looks like also Takahiro Tomiyasu and Mohamed Elneny uh, are also coming back, but they probably won't be available for the game tomorrow because of they've coming back from knee surgery. Um, Eddie Nketiah, it says here, has rejoined the group. He shook off an ankle problem and it looks like he's going to be in contention for a game at the London Stadium, but probably from the bench in all likelihood, it will probably be Gabriel Jesus who will be 
the player leading the line for Arsenal on the day. Anyway, I've waffled on enough. I'm just going to turn my attention to the live chat and just see who's coming in my absence. Um, right, so we've got Kent Hammers. He says, morning, lads. Hart says one all. Head says three or four nil. Well, I, I'm with you, mate. I mean, there's there's always that little bit of me that likes to try and sort of say, you know what, if if they have a bad day, if we have a good day. But let's be completely honest. How many good days have we had in the Premier League this season? If you look at all of our wins, they pretty much all had a slice of luck about them. You go back to the first win that we had this season, the way at Aston Villa, deflected goal by Pablo Fornells. It, it, the game last week, Fulham, I was there. More than a slice of luck. And pretty much all the Premier League games in between where we've got three points, we've we've been arsehole lucky, Kent. You know that as well as I do. I think it's probably going to be the latter with regret. Um, whether it will be as bad as 4-0, don't know. But then again, having said that, as I've just alluded to, you've got the goal difference situation, which at the minute does favour Manchester City. So if they sniff blood, Arsenal, I expect them to be like a great white and go flying at us. I, I really do fear for us tomorrow. I really do. I hope I'm wrong. Doug, hope you're well, mate. Um, for those of you watching, if you haven't already done so, Doug runs, as you can see there, the Dugout Football Channel. It's a Liverpool channel, but he's a really good guy. If any of you guys haven't, if you wouldn't mind giving him a subscribe to his channel and just sort of giving him your support, that would be great. True Cockney, hope you are well. Alfie, uh, he goes 2-0 defeat. Uh to West Ham. So, yeah, not really a shock there, mate. Uh, I hope you're wrong, but I think you'll probably be right. I think it will be a defeat. Um, Eastside, hope you're well, mate. Moyes loves to ruin players. Hopefully, we'll get a new manager and Skamaka stays. Yeah, as I say, I think that's the only way that he stays. But as I say, I think this is all the cover story. When it was announced that, oh, he's got a knee injury, he's out for a fortnight, but he might need an operation, blah, blah, blah. I could see what was coming down the road. I think most people here can. I think a lot of people sat here and thought, uh, we know what's how this is going to play out. And and so it's proved. Um, and it's, it's terrible because, and another thing that, that uh, not only from the point of view that this is another striker that we've basically taken as a potential for years to come to be our, our main man, getting the goals and all the rest of it. And we've pissed it away. But let's be completely honest. We paid, what, £35.5 million pound for this guy? We're going to be very lucky if we get 20. Let's be completely honest. Um, True Cockney, I can see us getting spanked like Newcastle. Yeah, 4-5-0. Wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised. Wouldn't be surprised. And Eastside's asking Alfie if he's still Moyes in. Um, he goes on to say he is till the end of the season. Look, I think, to be, to be fair to Alfie, I think that whatever our opinions on Moyes in, Moyes out, he ain't going anywhere. So, that, so so having the sort of conversation, do you want Moyes in, do you want Moyes out? It's kind of irrelevant because it's all hinges on David Sullivan and I can't see he's going to get rid of him now. I think we're stuck with him for better or for worse. Um, Eastside, uh, Rob, someone I know who works for the youth side said it's not a happy camp and everyone is falling out. Why are Sullivan sat there? That is a very good question. And I've heard similar things, mate. I've heard very similar things. Um, why is he sat there? it's difficult to say. I I do wonder how much of an impact the passing of David Gold had on David Sullivan. Now, how, how friendly they were, I don't know. Um, but I would imagine that they developed some sort of friendship being business partners for the best part of, what, 30, 40 years in football and in other areas. So I think that that they, that's possibly had a negative impact on him. Um, I, but other than that, I mean, I, I don't, really don't know East Side. I'm struggling to, I'm struggling to give you a reason, mate. I really am. Eamon, hope you will. Uh, you could say the same thing about Arsenal. When was the last time they had a bad day? Arsenal are due for one for sure. Hopefully, it's against us. Would you like to put your mortgage on it, Eamon? I wouldn't. I think if if it goes to form. If it goes to the way that teams have been playing of late, I think Arsenal win this at a canter. I really do. I think they probably don't even have to get out of second gear. And Doug goes on to see, he, he goes 3-1 Arsenal. 
may, I think, would be lucky to get away with a 3-1 reverse, if I'm being completely honest. If if we play like we did against Ghent, if Arsenal play to anywhere near their capabilities this season, this is going to be really, really tough. Really tough to watch. Anyway, um, I didn't get a chance to put a little video piece together. Uh, but basically because of Duke's situation at the pub, obviously. I, as I say, normally what happens is I pick the Arsenal, the, the away player, the, the, the opposition player that I think is key. And Duke picks the, the home, the, the West Ham player. Because obviously he's had bigger fish to fry, I've not got his key player. So you can sort of throw it as a key player. I've just got a couple of little things here. For anyone that wants the information put in their direction, they can have it. And if not, then don't worry about it. But who are Arsenal Football Club? Well, for those of you that don't know, they were founded way, way back in October of 1886. And yes, this was before I was born, ladies and gentlemen. They were actually formed as Dial Square Football Club. And they are originally from Woolwich, which is obviously the reason why a lot of Spurs fans have a bit of a problem with them because they turn around and say that they weren't even an awful London club in the first place. And that is actually a fact. They were formed in South East London. Um, they were basically um, a guy, a Scotsman by the name of David Danskin, got together with 15 fellow munitions workers because obviously the Woolwich Arsenal is obviously it was a it was an artillery complex. Um, and they and they got together and they formed a football club called Dial Square. Uh, they then changed their name to Royal Arsenal um, and also Woolwich Arsenal latterly. And then eventually they dropped the name Woolwich after they moved north of the river and became just the Arsenal. Um, they played, obviously, at Highbury initially uh, until around about, what, 18 years ago now, something like that, where they then moved to the Emirates Stadium, which is a capacity of just under 61,000. Their manager, obviously, presently is Mikel Arteta. Now, Mikel Arteta is someone that David Moyes has a bit of history with because David Moyes signed him initially on loan in 2005 for Everton Football Club, then completed the signing into a permanent signing before that. He'd, he'd been at clubs like Real Sociedad and Rangers. He also had a loan spell at Paris Saint-Germain. And he also played for Barcelona's B and C teams. He's from San Sebastian and he is 41 years of age. As far as his coaching career is concerned, he was Pep Guardiola's assistant at Manchester City for about three years before he eventually took the job at Arsenal back in 2019, which was a club that he represented between 2011 and 2016. As a player, as far as Arsenal Football Club is concerned, they finished fifth in the Premier League last season and they have a pretty impressive array of honours. Uh, they are 13 time champions of the league with one of those titles coming in the 2003-04 season when they went the entire league campaign undefeated. They have also got 14 FA Cups to their name. I believe seven of them were actually picked up by Arsene Wenger. So half of the FA Cups in their history were won by one manager. Only two League Cups, um, 16 Community Shields, one UEFA Cup Winners' Cup and one Intercities Fairs Cup, which the older people amongst you will know exactly what that trophy was all about. But the younger people are probably looking at that particular honour and going, what the bloody hell's that? Well, in case you didn't know, that is what was a precursor to what we now know as the Europa League. Now, my key player for Arsenal is this young man here. Very, very impressive individual a guy who I look at and just go, wow, how impressive. And he's nowhere near his peak because look at that. He's 21 years of age. He's still got his peak years ahead of him. The only hope I've got for this guy, Bukayo Saka, is that he doesn't go down the road of, say, a Deli Alley. I'm not comparing them stylistically. I'm just saying, obviously, Deli Alley was at the age of 21, thereabouts, was a hot prospect in Europe, was one of the top young players in the Premier League with the world at his feet. And you look at where he is now and you go, what the fuck happened? That's the only thing I, I, I hope for young English international players like Bukayo Saka and, and other players of that ilk, 
that they don't let it all go to their head. The one thing I will say is he seems quite a level-headed, humble guy. I don't think he's a flash Harry. I think he's got good people around him, his family, his 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 club, all the people around him that have his best interests at heart. So I don't think that's going to happen with this guy. But he's from Ealing, five foot ten. He's a winger, predominantly deployed on the right. So his direct opponent tomorrow will either be Emerson Palmieri or Aaron Cresswell. I hope it's not Aaron Cresswell. With all due respect to Aaron Cresswell, I think if it's Aaron Cresswell v Bukayo Saka one-on-one in a foot race, there's one winner and it ain't the guy from Merseyside. Um, squad number is seven. He is left-footed, and as you can see there, his youth career included Greenford, Celtic, Watford, and he then went to Arsenal as a youth player before he signed his pro forms on the 1st of July 2019. His record this season in all competitions, look at this, ladies and gentlemen, and this is why I look at him and go, uh-oh, 40 games of which 34 of them were starts, 13 goals, 10 assists. He has 23 goal involvements in 34 starts. Ouch. And this is for a career, 171 games, 145 starts, 36 goals, 39 assists. And as I say, this is a player that is nowhere near his peak. And for England, he's got 26 caps, 19 of which are starts, eight goals, and seven assists. This is the guy that we have to keep quiet tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. But they've got threats from all angles. You look at people like Sinchenko. You look at people like Jesus. You look at Martinelli. You look at Erdegaard. I mean, for God's sakes, they, Emil Smith-Rowe hasn't barely kicked a ball this season. Like, you know, part of that is down to injury and whatever else. But they've got players on the bench that you just look at and go, my goodness. I mean, just taking a look here, right, their last game away at Liverpool. Let's have a look. Their lineup consisted of Ramsdale, Zinchenko, Gabriel, Rob Holding, Ben White, Granite Xhaka, Thomas Partey, Martin Odegaard, Gabriel Martinelli, Gabriel Jesus and Bakayo Saka. Their bench... Look at this. As far as their forward line is concerned, on the bench was Leandro Trossard, Emil Smith Rowe, uh, and they've and, and they didn't have the the young guy Eddie Nketia, who I got to be honest, would I you know did I say last season I was impressed with him? No, not really. Duke was turning around and saying, no, this kid is something special, and I got to be honest with you. When I've seen him play this season, when obviously there was that time where Gabriel Jesus was out injured, he came into the team and you barely noticed. They just kept on scoring goals. They kept out churning wins. They kept at the top of the league and they've put themselves on the verge of, of winning the Premier League. So we'll wait and see. But that's, like I say, that's my key player for Arsenal. That's the that's the player that I think is absolutely crucial to us not getting a kicking. I think we're going to get beat, whatever happens. But I think if we keep him quiet, we we kind of blunt their edge a little bit, but they got they got threats from all over the park. I mean, you, when you look at a team that is top of the Premier League, has scored seventy two league goals in thirty games. That you know, so they're they're, they're better than a go, two goals every game in Premier League football. And as far as their defence is concerned, it's pretty tight. Twenty nine in those thirty matches. So a we're going to have to do very well to keep them out at one end. And B, we're going to have to do very well to score against them at the other. Now, as far as scoring goals is concerned, we haven't exactly set the world on light there. Hence why we're where we are in the Premier League. Again, just look at that. We have scored 27 goals in 29 Premier League games. So again, we've got the opposite side of the coin. Whereas they're scoring more than two goals a game, we're not even getting a goal a game. Uh, the only thing you could probably say is that uh, defensively, we've not looked too bad, but we have had a couple of hammerings of late, obviously away at Brighton and at home against Newcastle. Those two games alone, we conceded nine goals. 39 goals we've conceded in those 29 games. As I say, nine goals came in just two games alone. But like I say, I don't really see anything other than an Arsenal win. I really don't, regrettably. Anyway, let's go back to your comments whilst I've been waffling on again. Eamon comes back in and he says, Arsenal know the title might go to goal difference. Yes, they do. Is that is that the point I made a little bit earlier? So I can't see them easing up, attacking us, even if they're 4-0. It could get quite embarrassing for us. Cricket score. 
Eamon, that is my concern. That is my concern. If they sniff blood, they're not going to sort of go, ah, well, it's 3-0, job done. Like you say, they know that it could come down to goal difference. It could come down to goal scored. As I say, the goal difference situation between Manchester City and Arsenal, the goal difference for Man City is plus 48 and 40 plus 43 for Arsenal. As far as goals scored, again, Manchester City have the whip hand there. 75 plays 72 in Manchester City's favour. So if they see that they can make hay while the sun shines, if we're 3-0 down at half time, which is not inconceivable, I don't see Mikel Arteta saying to his troops, right, OK, lads, the game's won. Just keep it tight for the first 10 minutes and just coast through the rest of this match get the job done. No, no, no. He'll be going out and he'll be saying, once you've got the third, get a fourth. Once you've got the fourth, get a fifth. Really attack this lot. And and it could be really, really tough to watch. Pete, hope you're well, mate. Hope you are good. Uh, and Mandy as well. Thanks for coming along. Um, Odegaard is the key player. He 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 is very much the orchestrator of, of the Arsenal team. Uh, the reason I picked Saka, though, as I say, I, I like him as a player. I, I look at him. He's young. He's direct. He's fast. And as I say, he comes across really well. He comes across just as a really humble guy who just wants to, to absorb information like a, like a sponge absorbs water. He wants to really try and better himself. And I think he's got a great attitude. And he's, you know, providing he keeps his head about him, providing he keeps... On a on a on a level level sort of like head on him, I think he he could go on to be an absolutely sensational player. I think we've only just seen the be beginning of him. Um, I can see Arsenal coming at us straight from the kickoff. Uh, yeah, so can I, Pete. It could be like watching the Daleks on Doctor Who back in the seventies. Behind your hands, I feel another cricket score defeat. It's exactly what Eamon said earlier, mate. Um, and he goes on to say we aren't far behind in things. One are we? Um, yeah, yeah, about that. <laughs> yes, Newcastle's last trophy was the 69 Fairs Cup. That's correct. As I say, it was the precursor to what we now know as the Europa League. It wasn't actually a tournament that was run by UEFA. So UEFA don't recognise the Intercities Fair Cups on their records. The UEFA Cup, as it was, started in, I think it was 71 or 72, somewhere around that. Uh, and it basically was was what replaced the Intercities Fairs Cup. The Intercity Fairs Cup was was actually a tournament that was, as the name suggests, it was it was to do with trade fairs and all the rest of it. And actually, the first tournament, the first season they, they had that tournament, the tournament actually lasted, I think it was three seasons. It lasted between 55 and 58. And in the final from and I'm doing this this bit completely from memory. Um, I think the final was was Barcelona, who had the record amount of wins for that tournament, which I think was three, and they beat a London eleven, a London eleven. There you go. Upstairs for thinking, downstairs for dancing. Mandy says Saka is getting better and better. He absolutely is. We need to make sure we have two players near him. I don't think we're going to have one player near him, especially if the left back happens to be Aaron Cresswell. Um, what magical foot. That's enough of Arsenal now. Sorry, Mandy. As I say, I like to try and drill into with the opposition. Um, hopefully David Moyes has done the same. We were the last ones at Arsenal. To, we were the last ones to win at Highbury and the first ones to win at the Emirate. That's a long, long time ago. Um, Mandy agrees and says that we were the first to win at Spurs' new ground. Yeah, but we need to we need to stop living off of those sort of moments. And it's not like that those wins got us a trophy. Yes, they're nice little things that we can wave in the face. And, and, I, and I do occasionally turn around to the missus who has her, her Spurs leanings and say, yeah, but we were the first ones to come to your gaff and shit on your front lawn. Um, and it's nice to do that to sort of Arsenal as well and say, well, we were the last ones to do it, to beat you at the Emir uh, the Highbury. We were the first ones to beat you at the Emirates. We've got that little bit of, of a hex over them in that regard. But it's like, yeah, but how many times have we actually sort of done it other than that? Um, yes, we have. We discussed that earlier, Mandy. Yes, we have. Obviously, Manchester United twice, um, Tottenham. Uh, there's probably a couple of others that we've we've had a little bit of a hand in in sort of taking the course of the Premier League trophy from one destination to another. 
Chris says, uh, this is a game to keep it tight. A really good confidence boosting performance and keep the score down. Um, yeah, about that. If that's what you're expecting tomorrow, mate, I've got a horrible feeling you might be disappointed. I hope I'm wrong and I hope you're right, but I wouldn't like to put money on it. Anyway, um, Pete says, I do feel sorry for the younger fans who've never seen us win at anything. Well, I mean, when you say younger, I mean, I'm 47 and I have a very, very, I don't remember watching the 1980 FA Cup final. I have no memory of watching it as it unfolded. Obviously, I've seen it since, but I've got no memory of watching that game as it unfolded as a four year old. I know I had my photograph taken with the FA Cup with my dad, but I don't have, so I don't have any living, real memory of it at 47 years of age. If I'm a younger fan, fucking hell. Um, that's the missus. Hope you beat Arsenal 2 1. Now, there's a shock, isn't it? A Tottenham fan hoping that Arsenal get beat. And that must have really been something that she. As she was typing it, I'm pretty sure that her fingers were bleeding because it must have been really painful to her to wish West Ham to win. That's all I'm saying. But it's the old thing, isn't it? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. We need Noble to give a Churchill-type pre-match chat. The only problem is, Peter, is that probably Moyes won't let him in the changing rooms, number one, which means that Moyes will give the pre-match chat. And that will probably be a Churchill type pre-match, but it will be Churchill, the insurance bulldog, not Winston Churchill. Arrgh. Anyway, um, guys, I really don't have too much more to say. I, th I think that this is going to be really tough. Um, oh, hang on. Just going on to Matt's here. Uh, Matt says, so Moy said the Newcastle result was a freak result. Uh, we'll find out tomorrow, won't we? Yeah, he probably said something similar about the Brighton result as well, Matt. Oh, yes. Oh, roll, 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 roll. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Matt, honestly, we, we, if we got away, if we got away with a 3-0 defeat, 2-3-0, I'd go, do you know what? That's a lot better than I was expecting. I'm, I, I'm expecting... 4-0. I'm expecting 4-0, mate. I'm expecting 4-0. Okay, okay, I'll tell you what. Since since you've asked, Mandy, I will indulge you. Hang on. Let me have a swig of my tea. And the missus is saying Antonio and Bowen to score. She obviously hasn't seen Antonio for a while. That's why she's picked him. We're doomed. We're doomed. He don't like it up. And I will indulge you, Mandy. I will indulge you because I'm nice like that. I like to try and. So now the question was just to sort of get it up, just to, just so that there's no misunderstanding. Mandy's question was, what team would I choose? So this is not the team that I expect to see. This is the team I would choose. So I would choose Alphonse Ariola. I think that having a goalkeeper that could get the counter-attack moving, his distribution would be key. The only thing that worries me is that as far as that aspect was concerned, I don't think that he exactly covered himself in glory against Ghent. But I do think on balance, I would probably go with Alphonse Ariola still. Now, I, because of who we're playing... I normally like to try and play a back four and then sort of like either a three, three in front or four, two in front of the back line. Because of who we're playing, I think that we would probably have to play three centre backs like we did against Ghent. Again, my only concern is how would that go? Because obviously a lot of the, the centre backs in, in two cases would be players that played the other day, are they going to have enough gas in the tank to take 90 minutes of having players like Saka and Martinelli flying at them? I, I don't know. But I would go, as the left centre-back, I would go with Nyepagur. Now, 
One thing that concerns me, though, is that of late, we've started to see a few errors creeping into his game. Some of them quite big and some of them maybe not quite as, as glaringly obvious, but they're there if you're looking hard enough. But I do think that probably on balance, I would probably go with Naya Fager. But at the minute, I'm not entirely convinced that he's the Rolls Royce that we thought he was about a month ago. But we'll see. At the heart of the back three, which will probably become a back five in reality because our wing backs, and I would set us up with wing backs, I would be telling them to get as far up the pitch as you can. But the reality is, is that with those players, like I say, Martinelli and Saka coming at them, it's probably going to force the full backs quite deep. So it probably would end up being a five. But that wouldn't be my default intention. But at the heart of it, I would have Angelo Ogbonna. Now, I said it in the review of the Fulham game, is that I thought that his leadership, his communication, his experience really came to the fore. Now, we know that obviously he had the ACL injury that he picked up during the middle of last season, which will have just slightly taken the edge off of what pace he had. But I still think that he makes up for that with his experience, with his organisational skills, all of, all of those facets that he's picked up at the age of 34 years of age, Italian international, played in Serie A. He's been at the club for what, nearly eight years. So I think he, I would have him at the heart of, of the defence. If you want me to be really controversial, I'd actually give him the armband. I would give Angelo Ogbonna the armband, but that would probably put Declan Rice's nose out of joint. But that's another story. Again, that's just what I would consider doing. Anyway, so who's the right centre back? I hear you ask. Well, it probably won't come as a surprise to you. Yes, I'd have Kurt Zuma there. I would have Kurt Zuma as the right of the three centre backs. So that's my back three. So my right back. Now my right back is really it doesn't take an awful lot of thinking on my part. It's this fella, Vladimir Kufal. I think. He's like I say, look, he's not the player that we signed five million quid, came in. Oh, he's the best right back since Ray Stewart. Da, 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 da. Um, he's not quite on that level at the minute, and he hasn't been for a little while. Injuries have been a reason, but he's he's not quite been at that level for a little bit. But I do see that, that he's making little gradual improvements, and I think that as far as the right hand side is concerned. He's probably the best option that we've got there. So I would put Vladimir Kufal on the right as a wing back. But like I say, probably because of the threat that Martinelli is going to pose down that side, you'll probably find that he will end up operating as a conventional fullback with regret. But I would be saying to him at every opportunity, I want you to try and get forward. And as best as you can, get crosses into the box. Really try and, and threaten your opposite number. Now, left wing back. Oh, well, I, I could consider this guy, but his legs have gone. Let's be completely honest. I could consider this guy, but then I slap myself around the face with a wet fish and say, don't be so stupid. I could even make a case for young Ollie Skulls. I could, but I think that chucking him in like this would probably be something that could really dent his confidence and in the long term probably wouldn't do him any favours. I could even consider this fella and say put Ben Johnson there as a left wing back. But again, with regret, I think that I probably have to slap myself around the face with that wet fish and say, oh, come on, behave yourself. He's, he's just not good enough with regret. I just think that he's not quite at the level that we need. Um, I also think that him being shunted around isn't helping his career. So with all that in mind, I think that the left wing back is going to be this fella, if it was me, Emerson Palmieri. Now, I've got to be honest, since he's come into the starting 11, obviously he didn't start against Fulham in the last Premier League game. But I do think that he's come in and he's done a very 
very equitable job. He's not set the world alight, but he's been decent enough. And I think that he could play on the left wing back position. So now we come into central midfield. Um, I, do you know what? This is where I'm sort of umming and ahhing because, OK, so I would go three central midfielders and I would go two strikers. And when I say strikers, I would be telling them to play as strikers, not one as a sort of number nine and one as a slight as a support striker, if you get my drift. So, OK, so three central midfielders, I would have one of them holding and I would have two of them a little bit more forward moving. Now, the question is, do you have Declan Rice, who's going to play, who's going to play? He is going to be in my midfield, but is he going to be the holding midfielder with two others either side of him? Or is Flynn Downs going to be the one that's holding? Now, Flynn Downs, I've been very impressed with this season until Ghent. Against Ghent, I did look at him and think, this is a player that's not played many minutes in the first team, and it shows. There were challenges that he was putting in that he was his timing was off, and he was giving away fouls. But I do think that the only way that he can improve that is to play minutes. So I would have Flynn Downs as the holding midfielder. It's a it's a tough one. It's one that if you ask me tomorrow, Andy and, and others in the chat, I may well have a slightly different viewpoint. I might have rethought things. But I think for now, I'm going to say Flynn Downs as the holding midfielder and Declan Rice will be one of the other midfielders either side of him with a little bit more license to go forwards. Now, who is his partner? I could make a case for this fella, Manuel Lanzini. But again, I do you know what? His performance against Ghent, I, I don't know. It really polarised opinions because I saw some people that had the opinion that he played quite well, considering there was other people that thought he didn't do too much. Um, I could make a case for him, though. I do like Manuel Lanzini. I think that he's always trying to play forward passes. He's always looking to receive the ball. He's brave. He might not be as quick as he used to be, but I think he's still someone that where he, he keeps the possession ticking over. This is another fella that I could consider. And this is a guy that I think is actually, again, because he's been underutilized in my estimation this season. You look at him when he does play and you kind of think that he's a little bit off the pace. Pablo Fornells. However, and again, I said it a little bit earlier that the guy that I'm about to put forwards as Declan Rice's partner in the central midfield area, I did think that in his 16 minute cameo against Ghent, I did think that he looked arguably our man of the match, which for a 16-minute cameo is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I'd put Lucas Paquetar alongside Declan Rice. That would be my midfield three. So, we then come to who would I start as a striker? Well, who would I start as a striker? I'd love to be able to call upon this fella, Gianluca Scamacca. Yes, I know that the story is that he's got a knee injury. Yes, I know that the story is, oh, now he's got to go for surgery. I don't believe either story. I don't think he, A, needs surgery. I don't even think, B, he's got a knee injury. I think Jan Jan Lucas Scamacca's injury is David Moyes. So I would pick this guy, but we know that he's not going to be available. So I'm probably going to have to take him out of contention. I might even consider Divine Mubama. I think this is a young, effervescent, ebullion striker who is is going to really cause some opposition defences in the Premier League some problems. Hopefully he does it in a claret and blue shirt. But I don't think that tomorrow is his opportunity. Now, this next one might be quite controversial because this is the guy... I would play in one of the striker berths. I would play Maxwell Cornet because the one thing that we have lacked all season, all season, is a a striker with pace. It's a forward player with pace to burn that can just keep opposition centre-backs, opposition full-backs, opposition defensive mids 
on their toes and maybe not have the license to move as far up the pitch as would otherwise be the case. So I would play Maxwell Cornet, but I would be playing him as a striker. I would have also tried to get him on against Ghent if I was the manager to try and get some minutes in him. Obviously, that didn't happen, but I'd like to involve him. I really would, because I think his pace would be absolutely critical. So then the question is, who plays alongside him? Well, I think that Danny Ings getting his goal in midweek will do his confidence the world of good. But I think that if I had to make the choice between Ings and also this fella, where is he? Um, Antonio and this fella, Jared Bowen, I think that there's only one winner and it's this guy, it's Jared Bowen. I would be looking to involve Ings and Antonio from the bench, but I, I would like to try and involve, like I say, Maxwell Cornet, his raw pace to try and keep the opposition maybe five yards further back than would otherwise be the case. That's my thinking. That's my thinking. As I say, I, I hope that that's kind of explained my thinking behind it. And as I say, you could ask me this question tomorrow and I might give a slightly different answer. But anyway, let me have a little look. Let me have a little look and see what you guys are saying, whether you think that I'm on something or whether you think I'm a little bit off the pace. Morning, Joan. Hope you are well. Uh, uh, and then she goes on. Obviously, I've I've gone into into my little space, the time space continuum away from you guys. And obviously what Moyes would, well, look, what Moyes would look, you, you probably know it and we all know it. He'll put Fabianski in. He'll very likely keep the same back four that he did against Fulham, which means Cresswell plays. He'll probably in, keep so checking the team. He'll probably not make an awful lot of changes from the Fulham team, unless there are players with injury concerns. There you go. That didn't take me long. Um, Ariola needs a confidence-boosting run in the team. He does. He does. And he's another player that I wouldn't be shocked to see moving on to pastures new in the summer. I really wouldn't. I'm pretty sure that when he signed on the dotted line, probably the same as Skamaka, he probably had an impression of how things were going to go. He was going to be the number one. Everything was going to be. And then it didn't happen. And I wouldn't be shocked if he's on his way in the summer. And I wouldn't blame him. Um, if we stay up, we need to improve the keeper position. Yeah, I to totally agree with that uh, because I think that we should be moving Fabianski on. I think we should be putting Ariola as our number one. I'd, I'd still have, when I say move him on, I, I probably would still keep Fabianski as the number two and maybe involve him in a goalkeeping coach role within the, the academy with a view that when he retires completely, maybe involving him as a first-team goalkeeping coach if that position is available. Um, Mandy goes on to say, put Aguirre and Emerson on Saka. Yeah, I like I say, I would have Aguirre as the left centre-back. I would have Emerson as the left wing-back. So they would be occupying that area of the team. I think their pace could possibly handle, um, to a degree, the Kai Osaka. Um, Mandy, I was just going to say that Moyes has squashed his confidence. He has squashed confidence, the players and the fans, Joan. He's, he's done it to all of us, Mandy. He's done it to all of us. He really has. Um, who'd have thought Ogbonna would play such a key role this year? I'd play him too. Do you know what? I'd give him a contract for next season. I'd, I'd give him another contract for next season. I think he's still got more to offer. I think he's still got more in the tank. Uh, and exactly that, he... he well, he was definitely our best player last week, in my humble opinion, against Fulham. Was he our best player during Thursday's game? Not sure. Not sure. I actually thought Paquetar in 16 minutes did more than pretty much all the other players that, that done on the pitch, but that's just me. Um, what a smile. What, me or Ogbonna? Um, <laughs> um, anyway, Kufal was the only one who fought for the team on Thursday. Yeah, there wasn't an awful lot of fight that was on display, not from what I could make out. Um, Pete, would have thought Skiles is playing this morning for the under-18s. Yes, he probably is. Uh, but again, the question was asked, what would I pick? I, I would have considered Skiles. And here's the thing. If I was the manager, I would make sure that with the nine substitutes that you've now allowed in the Premier League, I would make sure one of them, at the very minimum, 
was a youth player every week. Home, away, Premier League, Cup, domestic, Europe, whatever. I would make sure that of all the substitutes that I'm allowed, at least one would be a player from the academy if I was in charge. Because I think that it's absolutely fundamental in the messaging that you're sending to the under 18s, to the under 21s, that there is a pathway and that what you're doing could translate into this is where you could get to. And if you're on the bench, then you could make the step up from the bench onto the pitch at some point. You you need to have that pathway that is obvious for these players. Because otherwise, I'm not being funny, when they've got an opportunity to sign on the dotted line their youth forms to come to West Ham's academy, do you honestly think that, that we're the only club that's that's sort of like putting a contract in front of them. No, they've very likely got offers from Arsenal. They've very likely got offers from Tottenham. They've very likely got offers from all sorts of other clubs. So we need to have something that says there is a progression to you guys and that you signing on the dotted line is not just, you know, we're not just sort of paying lip service to it or whatever. Um, will Rice be able to fully concentrate on the game with all the Arsenal talk? Well, if, hang on a minute, if there's any truth in the rumour that he's looking at going to Arsenal, you'd like to think that if there was anyone he would want to impress, it would be Mikel Arteta, wouldn't it? That's what I would think. If I if I was looking to, to audition and show whatever your job is, if you're looking to get a job somewhere, you want to impress the people, your prospective employer, don't you? So surely, surely he he should put in a performance as far as I'm concerned. I I, I think that we're probably going to have to, regrettably. I think that the, the way that Arsenal are playing, I think if we played a back four, I think that we get absolutely torn to shreds. I just I just don't think we would have enough to cope. Probably a back five is not even going to be enough. Um. Midfield, Rice, Paketar and four nows. OK, David, I'm guessing you'd have Rice as the holding midfielder. Um, yeah, I agree. I think he has to start. Um, Skamaka has deserted us. Stop his wages. Well, um, you could you could use that. I mean, look, I, I wouldn't blame people if they if they said that, as you have, he's deserted us. But could you blame him? I mean... You said it yourself. He's squashed the morale of the players. He's squashed the morale of the fans. I I believe that he was signed on the premise that he was going to be utilised with with players around him. And that hasn't happened. He was going to be utilised with a strike partner or partners. And that didn't happen. And that, I think their relationship was just broken down. And, and, and look, we, we know that People from a lot, by and large, people from Italy, they're quite emotional and, you know, they, they, they're they not backwards in coming forwards. I'm not saying that's a negative, but that's just a reality. Um, I think, and he, I think he's just gone bollocks to this. Uh, Skamaka was playing for Italy recently. Yes, he was. And he's gone backwards. When the going gets tough, the tough got going. Well, yeah, look, I, I can understand that. I can understand that, but I, I think he's been let down by the manager and he's not the first. Uh, I feel sick over what Moyes has done to Skamaka. Yeah, and like I say, we, we're going to lose an awful lot of money on him. Um, I don't know about that, Mandy. I'll, t- I'll tell you what, there's an awful lot of them in the Premier League, I'm afraid. Um, Skamaka doesn't want to pull his weight. He'll be off in the summer. Again, look, I'm surmising that it's it's been a relationship breakdown. I'm pretty confident that, that they've that they've sort of, their relationship is fragmented and I don't see it coming back. Um, He could have been the one striker we needed for years. Yep, exactly. Corne and Bowen would be my choice. Then we're agreed on that. We are agreed on, on the, on the front two partnership, a bit of pace, a bit of directness. Where is Corne though, Gatesy? Something weird going on to say the least. Well, yeah, I, I got to be honest with you. That was one thing that did kind of, frustrate me in the game against Ghent is that you looked on the bench there was Maxwell Cornet and he didn't set foot on the pitch at all 
And he made four substitutions. Well, he had another one to go, didn't he? So he could have brought him on. Don't understand it. Um, he's a quality player. Moyes has ruined him. I'm guessing he's talking about um, Skamaka. Uh, I'd play Corne, Bowen and Antonio front three. Again, if you ask me the question tomorrow, Eastside, I might even sort of come round to that way of thinking. I might sort of turn, like I say, I might sort of change formation. I might change personnel. Right here, right now, I would say I was asked the question by Mandy. I'm put on the spot, so there you go. Uh, club is paying his wages, not Moyes. <sighs> yeah, I, I, I get that. I get that. But Moyes is the team manager, and he obviously feels that he can't work alongside him, work under him. I dare say that, look, if there if there is any truth in what I'm saying, if in what I believe, and like I say, I've not got this from anywhere. This is just me making a hypothesis. I'm not saying this is fact. I'm saying this is what I believe to be the, the case. That I think that those two have had a falling out and that he's fucked off back to Italy. That's my belief. Now, if that has happened, should he be being fined because he's withdrawn his labour? Yeah, he should. Absolutely. I'm not saying that that we shouldn't fine him. What I'm saying is, is that would I, would I, if I was Gianluca Scamacca and I felt that I had been sold a pup and that basically I'd not been, what I'd signed on the dotted line for had not been delivered, that it, there was, there was some sort of, ah, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? misunderstanding, misinterpretation of what my role was going to be when I when I got the job. Uh, I, I think that I'd feel quite aggrieved and I'd probably consider walking. So, look, if if the club fine him, I dare say look, that he knows that that's coming his way and he's probably prepared for it. Good luck to him. Um, ben White struggles with pace and Zinchenko defensively isn't great, which is exactly why I would put Cornet as one of the front two. Uh, hope you're well, my friend. And uh, Skamaka will be a top striker next season. He will be. He will be. Uh, put your team up, please. I did. I did. Individually. I haven't had time to sort of do certain things, Mandy. I've got to be honest with you. We went out after we did the match review for the Genk game. We had a, a table booked. I went out with my missus and a couple of friends for a meal. We came back late. I've got up early as I can, but there's only so much I can do. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my team. As I say, it would be a, a Ariola in goal. Back three centre-backs would be from left to right, Aguirre, Ogbonna, and I would make Ogbonna the captain. Controversial. And I would put Zuma as the right centre-back. I'd have the wing-backs as Emerson left, Kufal right. I'd have Flynn Downs holding. I'd have Declan Rice and Lucas Pakatar either side of him. And I'd have two strikers, Maxwell Cornet for his pace and Jared Bowen. Um, we'll start. So, listen, listen, if, if you've got to go, mate, you've got to go. It is what it is. Don't worry about it. Uh, just make sure you wash your hands. Yeah. Um, Oggy would make a better captain for sure, says True Cockney. Yeah, I do. And and look, look, it's it's a matter of opinion. I'm not saying that Declan Rice has been shit this season. I think that compared to what he kicked out the last two seasons, his levels have dropped. But then again, everybody's levels have dropped around him. So it could, wouldn't be unreasonable for him, his levels to drop when everybody else has dropped. Now, the question is, why did they drop? Um, not, not, LOL, not. You've lost me, Mandy. You've lost me. Uh, Joan agree. I hope my... I hope Moyes pisses off in the summer. Then hopefully a new manager can speak to Skamaka. I, I think that the damage is done, mate. I think we've seen him in a claret and blue shirt for the last time. That's what I'm expecting. I'm hoping that that's wrong. If, the, if I'm proved wrong, no one will be happier than me because I want to see him rip it up. Uh, but I think regrettably that the damage is done. Might as well stay on the toilet as it won't be any different to the match tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Ockill Tree, tomorrow. Um, but you're probably right. I, I think most of the time I'll probably be shitting myself as well. Uh, not confident at all, but I'm not nervous. It's a resigned feeling. If we avoid a hiding, will help us in goal difference at least. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, I think if we got away with a 2 3 nil defeat, I think we probably got away with it. I'm actually expecting worse than that. 
Um, yes, I'll be gutted if Skamaka leaves. He is such a prospect. Ian, hope you are well welcome along, sir. Uh, to be honest, doesn't matter who plays. We are getting taught a lesson, to put it politely. Uh, yeah, all is good, good mate. Hope hope all is well with you and the family as well, matey. Um, yes, we do. We do. Um, I'll go a step further and make sure at least one young player gets a run out on the pitch at the end of the game. I think, like I say, I would have at least one youth team player on the bench every match, irrespective of the situation, irrespective of Premier League, domestic, Europe Cup, League, whatever. I'd always have a youth player in because I think that it's important to say to those players that are in the academy that there is a pathway from there to here. And and this is proof of it. And even if that player didn't step put on the pitch, even if you put an Ollie Skulls on the bench, even if you put um, a George Earthy on the bench, even if you put uh, an Oliver Skulls, Divine Mubama, um, Lewis Orford on the bench and they didn't set foot on the pitch, the mere fact that they've gone to Rush Green to meet up with the first team, get on the coach, make the journey to London Stadium, go into the changing rooms, Go onto the pitch, warming up, team talk, coming out with the team before the game, hearing bubbles. All of that experience would stand them in good stead. And then they go back to the to their mates on the Monday after the match and they go, oh, what was it like? What was it like? And it creates a buzz. And then they will then, the, their mates that haven't made it on the bench. So let's say, let's say for argument's sake, and I was, like I say, I know they're playing today. But just bear with me. Ollie Skiles is on the bench tomorrow. And Ollie, Piles does, Ollie Skiles doesn't play, but he goes through all of that experience. He then goes back into training on Monday. And all his mates who maybe haven't had that experience of being on the bench. What was it like, Ollie? And Ollie's all bubbly and he's enthusiastic about what a great experience it was. Yeah, I, I didn't get on the pitch, but you know what? It was a fucking great day and it really sort of, it opened my eyes on us on a number of levels. Oh, that's brilliant. And then they go out and they're, they've got a spring in their step and their levels have sort of go up another five, 10 percent because then they're looking. They want to be the guy on the bench for the next game. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I think it's what we need to do. But will we under Moyes? Probably not. Um, playing seven defenders just means we'll get more of a hiding. We need to attack fat chance of that. Yes, we play tomorrow. So we've got another day to prepare, um, another day to prepare our brown trousers. Saw something the other day, a few Premier League teams looking at Heggy. One of them was Manchester United. Yeah, what can you do? Uh, you can enjoy Saturday. Well, yeah, but it, it's just sort of like going to delay the inevitable. Hope you're well, Walshy. Hope you are well. Uh, Gary, bring on the Gunners. Irons get in their faces. Surprise, surprise. Win Hammers. Free to get in. Gary, I like your enthusiasm, mate. I like your enthusiasm. Would you like to put your mortgage on it? A 3-2 win for, for West Ham tomorrow. Would you like to put your mortgage on it? I wouldn't. Look, like I say, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, if look, if we got a point, let's be completely honest about it, on the basis of how both teams side by side have performed in the Premier League this season and also aligned with the fact that Arsenal have had a whole week to rest and recuperate and do their due, due diligence, try saying that when you've had a few. Whereas we played a game on Thursday, I think we are up against it. A 3-2 win to West Ham, would I like to see it? Of course I would. Of course I would. I've been supporting this club since, you know, I was old enough to know what football was, which was quite a long time ago. Do I think it will happen? Regrettably not, because I don't have the confidence that David Moyes will be able to get at the best out of his players. And he hasn't all season. The proof is there. How was the food? Hope you had a great evening. Do you know what? It was brilliant, Sharky. It was really good. It was a nice little Lebanese restaurant in Blue Water uh, called Comptor Libanis, if I remember rightly. Really nice, really good food. Uh, I'd been to a Lebanese restaurant once before, and it was when I went to Newcastle earlier this season with my daughter and one of my sons. Very nice food. If you've ever been, if you've never had Lebanese cuisine, but you've had Turkish, and I'm not talking kebabs here, I'm talking like a proper sit-down meal in a Turkish restaurant. If you've ever been to one of those establishments, 
it's very, very similar. Very, very similar. Lots of meats. So it's not probably a place for vegans or vegetarians. Probably this is not the cuisine for you. Um, but it was it was very nice. Lots of spices and, and all the rest of it. I liked it. I liked it. Uh, I finished six on football manager with the same team at the start of the season. So I'm a better manager than Moyes. I sold Rice in January for 93 million as well. Mm. Fact, well you don't, don't fancy sort of going into the dugout tomorrow, do you, mate? Uh, um, can you take the manager's job next month? Exactly that. Exactly what I was thinking. You say we lose money on Skamaka, but I look at it as we lose a good player. Hopefully we get a new manager and he stays. Again, I'd, I'd like that to happen, True Cockney. Don't get me wrong. But I think that the chances are that he's probably gone in the summer, even if Moyes goes. And I think that the fact that his season, this season, has been very stop-start. Part of it has obviously been de- a couple of little things that have got in the way, injuries and whatnot. Some of them have been genuine, I believe, but I don't think this one is. I really don't. And I think that any play, any team looking to buy Gianluca Scamacca in the summer knows the score because everybody knows the score, that he's pissed off and he wants to get out and that very likely West Ham will need to move him on for a number of reasons. One will be financial and two will be because when you've got a player who is a, 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 neg- a destabilising influence, he's not happy, he wants out and he, he's he's a bit of a bad egg in that situation. It, it, you, you need to move him on. It was like, it was just like um, Payet. Now, all right, we made money on Payet, but we didn't get the money that we should have with Payet. I mean, let's think about it. In the summer before he left, there was talk he was going to Real Madrid for 60 million quid. What did we get? We got 25 million from Marseille when he went in January. So, all right, we made money on him. We paid, what, 10, 11 million for him the, the summer before. So in 18 months, we, we made 15 million on him. But when you consider we could have made 50 million pounds profit, I, I'm, I, like I say, I think you need to move him on in that situation. If he's unhappy and if the situation's irretrievable, then I think with regret you have to move him on and you'll very likely lose money on it. But that's just the way it is. Uh, hope you're well, Cyber. Hope you are good. Uh, just woke up at 39 minutes past 10 o'clock. You've just woke up. What? What were you out on? Were you, were you out on the lash last night? Or yeah, well, no, not the lash, but whatever. Um, uh, I'm in between jobs at the moment. Sign me up. I'd recall Vlasic and Masuaku. Get rid of Cresswell, Socek, and we'd have three five two. Whip fast, direct passing, expressive attacking play. Interesting. Uh, Cyber says hopefully a draw, but says Socek mustn't start. I think if we get a draw, mate, we've done very well. Uh, still laid in bed, bit busy few days. Missed all of about 10 minutes of the Ghent game. That's all right, mate. Don't worry. Uh, you've got my approval. Very nice, Gatesy. Good to hear. Nobody wants Sochik to start apart from one man, and he picked a team. Yes. Have you had Bangladeshi cuisine in Brick Lane? Highly recommended. You know what? We actually was talking about Brick Lane yesterday, because uh, obviously... For those of you that don't know the geography of London, Brick Lane's in the east end of London. And one of the things that it's known for is is its curry establishments. And I've never experienced this, but I'm reliably informed that basically they'll literally pull you in with offers of free drinks or this or that or whatever. Um, In answer to the question, I've never been, as I say, I've never been to Brick Lane. Have I ever had Bangladeshi cuisine? Well, let me put it this way. My understanding is, is that most of the, what we would call the Indian restaurants in England are actually very rarely run by Indians. They're usually run by Bangladeshis or something around that particular part of the world, maybe Pakistan, whatever. So have I tried it? Very probably. Very probably. I probably thought it was Indian because it said above the door that it was an Indian takeaway, but it was actually probably run by a Bangladeshi family. There you go. 
Uh, it was really nice. It was really nice meal. And as I say, I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend that particular establishment if any of you are anywhere near Blue Water in Kent. Uh, as I say, it's a place called uh, Comptor, Le Lebanese, I think it's called from memory. Lebanese restaurant. Um, it's if you know Blue Water Shopping Centre, it's the lower section and it's right opposite Ann Summers. Just saying, I, you know, I, I was sat there and every time I looked sort of like over that way, there was there was a mannequin all done up in in sort of finery. What what can I say? You know, I might have made a suggestion to the missus that, you know, if, if she sort of maybe wants to sort of treat herself, I'd, I'd be quite happy. The problem was, is that we actually was really enjoying the meal. And by the time we come out, the shutters were down. So that that's that was that idea that sort of hit the buffers. So there you go. Uh, don't forget, I'm fasting. You know, Ramadan only a week left. Well, it will soon be over, mate. Soon be over. That's one of the reasons I'm not religious, mate. So there you go. Uh, rather than me, cyber, I have no willpower whatsoever when it comes to food. Exactly that, mate. Exactly that. I love a curry in Brick Lane. I've, like I say, I've never been, mate. Never been to Brick Lane. Never had a curry at Brick Lane. It's one of those things I've got to tick off. I love a curry. I love a little bit of a, you know, a lamb gel frazy or something like that. Uh, a king prawn booner. How about that? Um, almost got lynched walking down the road to go into restaurants. Yeah, as I say, I've heard a lot of people say that is that you 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 know you, you're walking along minding your own business and you've literally got people hauling you in with all sorts of offers and and threats and Christ knows what. Is it near Menkind in Blue Water, mate? I have got no idea. I know it's opposite Ann Summers, so. If you can find Ann Summers and look to the other side, you'll see this restaurant. Oh, apparently it is. I'm reliably informed. Did anybody see the Bundesliga game? They had to stop so players observing Ramadan could take on water and energy. Well, they've done it in the Premier League, haven't they? They've had games that they've stopped. Evening games, this is, obviously. Um, and they've stopped the game sort of 20 minutes, half hour in. And then you see a couple of the players going over the touchline and they're, they're doing what they do and and sort of like whatever. So, yeah, it's it's not just the Bundesliga, mate. It's, they've done it in the Premier League. So. so anyway, my score prediction, doing this in a rather roundabout fashion. We've started talking about lingerie and curries and, and Lebanese cuisine and blue water and whatever. Roundabout thing. My score prediction tomorrow is, is and with regret, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say it. My prediction is West Ham United nil, Arsenal four. I, I think we're getting smashed. I really do. Um, I actually remember the first season at London Stadium, watching Arsenal beat us 5-1 with Alexis Sanchez that was in full flow. And we got smashed 5-1 that day. And always remember it, and my kids will tell you this story, that we was watching it, and it might have been by this stage 4-1, I don't know. And my kids, all three of them, were literally pleading, begging, Dad, can we go? This game is over. It's done. Can we go? And I said, no, you're watching all of it. And you know what? Do you know what? They've never asked since because I turned around to them and they, they asked me for a reason. And I said, it's character building. Character building. Yeah. If you can sit there and watch a 90 minute match where you're getting absolutely humiliated. Then that is character building. And I turned around to him and I said, when you get older in life and you go for a job interview and you don't get the job. Or you've got a job and you get sacked because someone can do the same job as you cheaper or work longer hours. Or you get dumped by your boyfriend or girlfriend or, or whatever. You have some sort of adversity that hits you in life. The fact that you've been a West Ham fan and we've won fuck all since 1980 and we get smashed at home by Arsenal five goals to one in our first season in the London Stadium and you've watched all 90 minutes of it. That resilience that you've built up, when those adversities come at you in your later life, 
They will bounce off of you like a bullet bounces off of Superman. It won't bother you because you'll sit there and you'll go, I'm used to this shit. I'm a West Ham fan. <laughs> um, Pete comes in, says he reckons it's going to be 6-0 to Arsenal. It wouldn't shock me because it was the point was made earlier. I don't know if you was you was here at the time. They it could all come down to goal difference, goal scored. So they're not going to relent. They can't relent if they if they sense that they can really rack up the goals and and improve their goal difference, improve their goal scored column, which could be critical once the thirty eighth game is played. They're going to do it. And they're not going to feel sorry for us. And neither should they. Neither should they. Uh, you say that, Sharky, but you can see it, can't you? You can see it. Simon, hope you're well, mate. Thanks for popping in. Do appreciate it. Uh, while they while they have water for Ramadan. Uh, yeah, 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 with you. Uh, it wouldn't shock me, though. No, no, absolutely. Uh, am I taking them tomorrow? Um, one of them. One of them I am. One of them is going to be working and one of them is away for the weekend. There you go. Uh, you must have said to your kids, suffer little children who come with me. No, no. As I say, I just told them it was character building. I just, uh, you know, those three words, it's character building have been ingrained on their little brains now. They don't even ask a lot of the time. They just go. It's character building, isn't it? And I'm just, I just nod, just nod. They don't even have to ask. Listen, like I say, I'm building resilience in them. The world, as, as Rocky said in the film Rocky Balboa, he turned around and said it, didn't he? He turned around and said, the world is a mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are. It will beat you to your knees and keep you there if you let it. Remember that? Remember that speech to his son? You me or nobody can hit as hard as life but it ain't about how hard you hit it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forwards and that's exactly what i've done with my kids i have got all of them to a certain level of toughness in their life at their age so that as they move forward in life when they get shit hitting the fan and it's coming in their general direction of pretty high velocity they can just go not a problem to me as a West Ham fan do you get used to suffering yeah of course you do of course you do we've we've won fuck all in 43 years we've won fuck all I mean we won the Intertoto Cup and that was really essentially a pre-season tournament to get into a proper tournament in UEFA which we lasted what was it one or two rounds I think it was two rounds we went out to Stoya Bucharest didn't we uh so yeah, we, we celebrated that. And did you ever see the Intertoto Cup? It was about the size of an egg cup. I remember seeing a photograph of Steve Lomas back in the day. And I actually can't find this photograph now. I've looked for it on, on Google and I cannot find this photograph. And I swear to God, they put it in a program after we beat Mex and got that trophy. And there was a photograph of, of Steve Lomas, who was the captain at the time, holding this little fart ass trophy. You know, you remember that, you, know, you know, like the Ashes trophy that they have sort of like England against Australia for the cricket, you know, little thing, f fucking pathetic, really. You sort of think that's it. That's what you're sort of like having a sort of like a five test series for, you know, with each test lasting five days. And that's what you've won. Something that big. Well, the Intertoto Cup was was a similar sort of size, maybe a little bit bigger, but not significantly. And Steve Lomas, he, he looked fucking embarrassed to hold it. It was terrible. Uh, anyway, would Moyes go if they smash a 6-0? Well, he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go of his own volition. So the question would be, would Sullivan get rid of him if they smash a 6-0? Probably not. Probably not. I think if, if we got smashed 6-0 at home by... Who have we got left at home? Who have we got left at home? I'm trying... Trying to think who have we got because City's away, Brentford's away, uh, Leeds, but that's the second to last game. Uh, hang on, let me just have a little look at the fixtures because there's only eight left after this, isn't there? What's our home? Oh, god, wow! As I mean, to be fair, 
of all the home games we've got left, you're looking at this, bloody hell. Liverpool, uh, Manchester United and Leeds. So there's two teams that are, that are going for European competitions. I think Liverpool are probably still in the hunt for it, but they're going to probably need snookers now. And a team that are looking to try and get away from relegation. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Probably not. I think if he was going to pull the trigger, he'd have done it before now, regrettably. Uh, West Ham are a religion. Born into it and fans until we die. Yeah, I mean, look, I could have changed clubs at various points in my childhood. I mean, I grew up in Kennington. I could have become a Chelsea fan. I could have become a Millwall fan because of obviously the geogra geography of where I used to live and where a lot of my family still do. Um, my granddad was an Arsenal fan. No. I moved or sort of lived quite close to Crystal Palace for a period of time. Didn't change allegiances then. So, yeah. Um, do you remember when I met Sullivan last week? He closed his eyes while I took a picture with him. Um, yeah, it was a great photograph. Great photograph. It was uh, David Bailey-esque. I'm sure that, that David Sullivan was thrilled to finally meet you at last. Um I, I, I do try. I do try, Joan. Um, must be so boring when you support a win that wins, uh, support a team, I think you mean. Uh, must be so boring when you support a team that wins things on a regular basis. Um, I wouldn't know. You know, it's like people turn around to me when they find out what my birthday is. And when I turn around and say, oh, my birthday's Christmas Day. And they go, oh, well, it must be horrible. And it's like, oh, I've got nothing to compare it against. My birthday's been on Christmas Day since the day I was born. So I don't know what it would be like to have it on any other day. So I can't make that comparison. Um, yeah, got that, mate. Got that. Uh, 99 glory in match. Yeah, I mean, look, we enjoyed it whilst it lasted. I'm not sort of like taking the piss, but let's be honest, that was a pre season tournament to get into a proper tournament. Um, and yeah, people forget when we won the Betway Cup, uh, something to cherish. Listen, that's and that kind of says it all, Pete, that we, if we actually, and I know you're probably saying it tongue planted firmly in cheek, but if we're actually celebrating winning a pre-season tournament, a one-off game against a team that are just there for a bit of a jolly up, then then that tells you all you need to know. Liverpool and Man United, yeah, great. I, I looked, mate. It was uh, not good. Um, looked like a Fabergé egg. You, and you remember the photo, so I didn't imagine it. I didn't imagine it. I have looked for that photograph. I've Googled it. I can't find it. This photograph, I'm sure it was on the pitch. I'm sure it wasn't at Mets. I don't think this photograph was taken. I'm pretty sure the vague recollection I've got of it is that Steve Lomas is stood on the pitch at the bowling ground Upton Park with a West Ham home kit on, home shirt, and he's holding it like that, right? And he's got this smile on his face, but it's not a smile of, we've won a trophy! I'm so happy! It's like, I've got to do a fucking photograph with this fucking pathetic fucking trophy and look like it's an achievement it was that sort of smile it was like i really don't want to do this so yeah man united liverpool and leeds there are remaining home games brilliant we won't win another home game the rest of the season well the only thing i would say is that that man united seem to have gone a little bit off the boil since they won the league cup and liverpool away from home aren't the best so I do look at them and go, do you know what? We might get something there. Might only be a point each, but we'll see. You don't. Do you know what? And I've even told the wife this next piece of information, Sharky. Yeah, I would rather change my wife than my football team. And yes, I have told her that to her face. Um, I was in Kennington yesterday, a.k.a. Battersea Mosque. Well, hang on a minute. If it's Battersea Mosque, how the hell was you or did you go through Kennington? OK, I I, I think because I was going to say because because Battersea Mosque, I would suggest would be in Battersea, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I don't know. Uh, how was the food last night? You, we, we said this earlier, but if you wasn't here, if you're ever near, I'll give it a plug. Fuck it. Um, Blue Water Shopping Centre. It is a Lebanese restaurant called Le Comptier, uh, sorry, Comptier Lebanese. 
And if you know the geography of Blue Water Shopping Centre, it's on the lower level and it is right opposite Ann Summers. So it gave me something to look at when the conversation got a little bit stunted, which it didn't actually. It didn't. It, the, the conversation flowed. We were with a couple of friends. We was we was having a nice little chat and catch up. It was a really good evening. Really good evening. Um, I'm a Daggers fan as uh, I'm a Daggers fan as well, mate. Is that okay? I do. Or do I have to be fully? West Ham United, you can do what you want, mate. It's free country. Um, I I loosely follow Dartford Football Club simply because that's where I live. Uh, would I call myself a, 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 an active fan of theirs? Well, put it this way. If you was to ask me what their result was last week, I couldn't tell you. I know they're doing well in the league this season, but you can you can do what you want, mate. I mean, look, if you, if you want to follow Dagenham and Redbridge, it's, up, it's entirely up to you. It's a free country. Um, if you was to turn around to me and say that you are a fan of West Ham and Tottenham, then I'd turn around to you and go, are you you, you feeling all right, Mo? Are you feeling all right? Dagenham and Redbridge, let's be honest about it. There's no real rivalry between West Ham and Dagenham and Redbridge. In fact, there's, there's a very definite partnership between Dagenham and Redbridge and West Ham United. All you've got to do is look at the facts. Well, where did the women's team play? Anyway. Look at the size of the ashes they play for in cricket. That's a joke. Yeah, I mean, you you know, obviously know the story. I'm guessing that basically the story is is that they reckon, and 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 it's one of those things that they're not quite sure, because a lot of people think that what's in this particular urn is the ashes of a bale, a cricket bale. Which, if you don't know the sport of cricket, and I don't assume that everybody that might be watching this either live or at a later stage. The bale is like the little piece that sits. You've got the stumps that come up from the ground up, and there's three of them, one, two, three. And there's two bales that sit on top of the three bales, sort of like. So you've got one bale from the outer to the middle, and then the next one from the other outer to the middle. So they're the two bales. And apparently in that urn is the ashes of, I don't know if it's a bale or both bales or whatever, from a test match between England and Australia, sort of like 130 odd years ago or whatever it was. But some people say it wasn't Bales, it was a ball. I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether they, they sort of really know what was in there. I mean, for all they know, it could be the ashes of some dead cricketer for all I know, although it would probably have to be quite small. Anyway, back in the 70s, when I was in junior school, some kids used their... Ch- used to change their teams on a weekly basis, depending on who was the top of the first division. That's, that's something that still goes on now. I mean, I've, I've seen kids and that actually I've, I've got a kid in my family that some years ago supported Manchester United and then changed allegiances to Chelsea. I'm not going to embarrass them, but they're a very close member of my family and they might even be watching and they'll probably dispute that. They'll probably come back at me and go, I've always been a Chelsea fan. No, you fucking didn't. I remember when you was little and you supported Man United, most definitely. And I have photos to prove it. Liverpool are there for the taking, but Moyes will set up like it's Liverpool of last year. He'll probably set up like it's prime Liverpool, you know, when they won three European Cups in the early 80s, late 70s, whatever. Uh, yes, tattoo of partner's name is much more likely to be removed than a West Ham one. Exactly that. Exactly that. Um, I'm in Chislehurst. Are you? Are you? Yes, that's only down the road, mate. That's only down the road. Chislehurst caves and all that. Yes, I know it well. Oh, that started five minutes ago. Is that on YouTube? Does anybody know? Are they are they streaming it on? Hang on. I'll have to get off here because you guys ain't going to want to listen to me rabbiting on. Hang on a minute. If this is on. I should probably bugger off, shouldn't I? Really? Um... There you go. West Ham United Football Club. Is there any lives going? Well, I can't see it. Unless any of you guys can direct me and send me a link. I can't see any. I can't see any live stream for the under 18s. And of course, it's against Arsenal, isn't it? Who we play in the Youth Cup final. Bloody hell. Um, True Cockney, what other club have you got a soft spot for? I'm Mill. Whoa! 
Whoa! Ooh, you've got a soft spot for Millwall, and you're a West Ham fan. Ah, oh, I mean, look, right, okay, just back up, back up the truck. As I say, I'm originally from Kennington. I've got a lot of Millwall fans who are family members. Good, good people. Have I got a soft spot for Millwall? Oh no, 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 no. Don't have a soft spot for Mill. I have a, a a respect for them as a working class club and on all the rest of it. But that's probably about as far as it goes. I wouldn't say I've got a soft spot for Millwall at all. If I had to say a soft spot, don't actively support them. But for family reasons, I'm going to say there are probably two clubs that I've got a soft spot for. And... For those of you that saw the match reaction video that I did after the Fulham game, you'll know that one of them is Fulham. And you'll know that the reason for that is because my great uncle played for them. I don't know at what level. All I know, the story that I got told is that the, my great uncle Jim played for Fulham Football Club. And one of his teammates was Johnny Haynes, who was obviously the England captain. So it's quite a big thing for me to, to say that I've got a great uncle that at one stage played football alongside a guy that went on to captain England. I don't know whether he played for Fulham for the youth team, the under 18s, the reserves, the first team. I've got no idea, but he played for Fulham Football Club. So I've got a soft spot for Fulham Football Club. I've also got a slightly soft spot for Arsenal, and that's only because of my late grandfather. That's it. That's it. If my granddad supported raggedy ass Rovers, I'd probably have a soft spot for them because uh, my granddad was one of my heroes growing up. So, uh, Malsey. Good to see you, mate. I think we need Lasagna Gate to reappear. I think we need more than that, mate. I think we might need to uh, to put maybe some itching powder in their pants. I think we might need to um, lead boots on. And probably even that might just all that will do is keep the score down. Haven't found anything yet. Um, I'll tell you, you're on about the stream, are you, mate? So, uh, got no spot for any team. Only West Ham and West Ham only. No, fair enough, Pete. As I say, and also I, I keep a sort of passing sort of glance on, on our local football team, Dartford Football Club, just to sort of see how they're getting on. Uh, every now and again, we go up there to watch and play if if there's nothing else going on. Do I actively support them, if I'm being brutally honest? Probably not. Uh, well, not probably not. I don't, but I just sort of keep an eye out for their results. That's pretty much it. Uh, listen, mate, you don't have to apologise. You know, I'm only pulling your leg. It's... um. I say like, you 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 have a soft spot for who you want to have a soft spot for, and you have it for the reasons that you you have it for. As I say, I've explained my reasoning for Fulham and Arsenal being teams that I tolerate, teams that I've got a, a bit of time for. Um, that's about it. Um, Orient, South End, Dagenham, and Redbridge. A again, I can understand that. You know, the East End, Essex sort of corridor. That's the three teams there. Although obviously. Orient in latter years have uh, well and truly nailed their club colours to, to Tottenham sort of like direction generally in the last few years, I think is fair to say. So that's fine if, if they if they do that. I mean, I know I've heard people turn around and say that they would go and watch West Ham one week and then when West Ham were away, they'd go and watch Orient the next week sort of thing. I've heard a lot of people say they used to do back, that back in the day, but I think those days are long gone. Um, lasagna for all the Arsenal players. Yeah, double helping. Double helping. Uh, I live five minutes walk from Chelmsford City. No interest in going there, even if I got free tickets. What? Not even if they sort of, you know, said, well, we'll get you into the executive box. Do they have an executive box at Chelmsford City? You know, pie and chips as your halftime meal. I don't know. What, what, what would... What would what would make you, Pete, consider it if they sort of you know laid on a free bar? If if they got I don't know, um, let's let's think, Claudia Schiffer to sort of bring you your your halftime bag of nuts or something. I don't know what what could Chelmsford City do to tempt you from your humble abode to Chelmsford City's football ground that I don't even know the name of. Malsey comes in. My other soft spot is Celtic. Growing up when Hartson signed and loved Henrik Larson, but don't follow it religiously. 
Don't mention religion and Celtic in the same sentence. It's not a good idea, Milesy. It starts all sorts of conversations off. You know how it starts. Um, do you know what? It's funny. I've, all, I've often thought that if there was a Scottish team that any West Ham fan should follow, it probably should be Celtic. Because there's been an awful lot of players that we've shared. So you look at it. I mean, you've just mentioned one there in, in John Hartson. Well, there was also Frank McAvenny. There was also Stuart Slater. There was Mark Reaper. I believe Ayal Berkovic played for, for Celtic as well, didn't he? Um, there's been a number of players. Ian Wright. Um, other Celtic West Ham connections. There's There's been quite a lot down the years, hasn't it? So if there was a team... I, I, this is what I've always thought. I've always thought if there was a team that a West Ham fan, if a West Ham fan ever turned around and said, I want to follow a Scottish team as well, who should it be? Probably it should be. Di Canio, yes. Of course he did. Of course he did. How could I forget? Um, yeah, there's been all sorts of players that have played for both clubs. Um, I'd say McAvenny, Di Canio, Reaper. Uh, Steve Walford, he, I know he was, he was the assistant manager under, um, Martin O'Neill, wasn't he? He's, um, yes, I do. In fact, they, they brought, didn't they, they brought that back. In fact, I've got a photograph. I know they did. There was a photograph, the last game at, at Upton Park against Man United. And they actually brought a geezer. I remember being in the Bobby Moore lower and they had a couple of guys in sort of like overalls and this sack, and they were just chucking peanuts up, and people were sort of catching it. was a little bit of... Um... Yes, he was. He was. He was Celtic manager. I don't think he played for them. Uh, at least I don't think he did, but he definitely played for us, and he definitely was their manager. So there are a lot of connections between West Ham and Celtic, isn't it? And I believe, am I right in saying, and I, I, I've never been to Glasgow, I'll hold my hands up here, I'd, I'd, I'd love to go and experience an old firm game. And I probably shouldn't name this person, but I, I did an interview. And if you, if you go back, you can probably work out who I'm about to talk about, but I won't name them directly. But I did an interview with someone who has a connection to Scottish football. And I asked them, and this was an off-air conversation, Rangers or Celtic, if you could go to... Ibrox or Celtic Park to experience an old firm derby, which one's the best atmosphere? And this person, this gentleman, turned around and said, well, they're both magnificent atmospheres. Ibrox is a great stadium, but I'd have to give the edge to Celtic Park. If you're going to go and see an old firm derby and you want to have the, the best experience as far as sort of absorbing a sort of like an electric atmosphere, he said, go, go to Celtic Park. So... Rangers, for me, I'm not a Catholic. Well, I'm not religious at all. Um, I mean, obviously, Rangers is Protestant. So are, are you saying you're are you Church of England? Are you religious? Listen, if you are, it's fine. I'm, I'm not. I, I don't follow any religion. So it doesn't bother me. I'm purely talking from a football point of view. So I, I, I really couldn't care less from, from a religious point of view. It, it doesn't interest me. Um, he took Slater from us. Oh, do you know that story, Walshy? You know the story? Uh, he, look, he's, he said it, if, if anyone goes to any of the events, in fact, he, he said it on the interview that Duke did with him on, on this channel, where he tells he says the story about a, a, an agent that Liam Brady put in the path of Stuart Slater by the name of Finton Jury, if I've got his name right. And the, the, the story was that they were going to make Stuart a very good offer. In fact, they did make Stuart a very good offer. And Stuart wanted to sign it, but this Finton jury turned around and said, "No, no, no, just just hold it there. You know, let's 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 play a little game of hardball here. Let's play a little game of chicken." And it ended up going a little bit pear shaped for poor old Stuart because eventually West Ham withdrew the contract offer and went ah bollocks, and he ended up going to Celtic and injuries and and one thing and another. Uh, that's how Slater was sold. And at one time, Brady was his agent. No, it was, as I say, it wasn't Brady. Liam Brady wasn't his agent. Crash. Liam Brady was, wasn't Stuart Slater's agent, but Liam Brady put him in touch with, and I think this guy was Liam Brady's agent. I'll say his name was Finton Jury. 
And yeah, it, it, it all went a little bit pear shaped for him from that point on. You'll never walk alone is unreal feeling inside. Um, would love to experience it. Anfield does it for me. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, they 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 sing that as well, don't they? When they come out at Celtic Park, they they sing "You'll Never Walk Alone." A bit like um, Borussia Dortmund's another one. I'd like to go to the Westfalen Stadium and watch, you know, the yellow wall all holding up the scarves. You'll never walk alone, blaring out. I mean, look, Bubbles is is the best football song for me, but a very close second. That's probably it. Where is Winnie? A very good question. Right there, she is. She is curled up on the sofa. She's having a nice little kip. She's had a really hard day sitting on her ass. Lazy bugger. The missus took her out for a walk, actually. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, I've been going for an hour and 45. I, I probably should bugger off. Do you know what? But I'm still, I can't believe that they haven't got the under-18s game against Arsenal on. That's really disappointing. I can't believe this. They've really missed a trick there. That is that is poor. That really is poor. Uh, she is. Yeah, she hasn't had any accidents for a little while. Well, no. Tell a lie. There was a little deposit that she left. But that's because what we've also discovered is she doesn't like the rain. You take her out. And she's just like, no, bollocks, I'm going back off indoors sort of thing. And she'll actually hold it in if you get my drift. Uh, I just don't like their banners uh, or their songs against my... I, yeah, I, I, I get that. I get that they're obviously because they're, uh, they're, they're leanings towards the Republic of Ireland and, and this, that and the other. I mean, look, I'm half Irish, so I, I, I sort of got a foot in both camps, really. Um Obviously, I'm English born and bred and, and England's my team. But I do obviously have that soft spot for the, the, my mother's nation of her birth. Um, but yeah, I, I, look, I can see both sides of it. I can I can understand that they they have their songs and there's history and this, that and the other. And but then obviously, you know, it's a long time ago. And I just think, yeah, let it go. Um, but there you go. It, some people can't. One all. Oh, mate, that would be a fantastic result. That would be absolutely amazing if we could if we could get a point off of them and deny them the extra two. I would be very, very happy. I just can't see it, Milesy. I, I, I just can't see. I can't make a case for the defence that we're going to hold them out. I've already said I think we're getting done four nil, and I like to try and be optimistic but I think I have to temper that with with a sense of realism we've not been good all season the games that we've won in the Premier League we've been very very lucky to to win by and large I don't think any of the games that you, there's, there's no game that I can think of in the Premier League that we have won this season and I'm looking here right we have won in the Premier League the grand total of eight matches so just off the top of my head I think we was lucky away at Villa we were certainly lucky in the home games against um, uh, Fulham and Bournemouth. We was lucky away at Fulham last week. So that's four games where you'd have to say we were quite fortunate of the eight wins. Uh, the other eight wins, well, there was Southampton at home. There was Wolves at home. So that's six. Who else have we beat? Um I say, I just, I just, yeah, I, I struggle to sort of make a case. I mean, look, if if ever there's a team that's going to do it and and you know spoil it, spoil a party for a, a team going towards the title, it's it's us usually. But can't stand Lorraine either. Okay, Lorraine who? Um, Lorraine Kelly, Lorraine Chase. I don't know. I'm surprised the club or Arsenal are not showing the under 18s. Yeah, I'm I'm really disappointed in that. I thought they would. They would have been on that, especially because they're playing each other in a couple of weeks. Not surprised Arsenal aren't showing it as they are way down the league, but we should be showing it. Well, we're the home team, so we should be showing it. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Rob. Enjoyed the show. Everyone, goodbye. Hopefully we'll all have a good weekend. Yeah, cheers, True Cockney. As I say, I've, I've rambled on for a long time now. I'm probably going to disappear shortly. You are more than welcome. Uh, I think Downs, Rice, Packetar in front of the back four will be key. Yeah, as I say, I, I went through it earlier, Milesy. You're going to have to go back and, and have a look. 
I, I was asked the question, what would I pick? And as I say, I've done it completely on the spot. I could have a different answer tomorrow. I think he will play with a back four, very likely, but we'll see. Declan Rice hat trick. Can you see it? Can you? Really? No. Um, Paqueta to score a penalty. That would be amazing if we got a draw. It'd be a miracle and boost us up. Everton, yes. Um, did we did we two nil? I thought we were the better team, but they were crap. So yeah. Um, da, 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 beat Fulham twice. Yes, we did. Listen, you're allowed to lay in. I had a little bit of a, a wind up with um, Cyber earlier, and and sort of said about him getting up late. Uh, being out on the on the on the source as I put it, or worse to that effect, and obviously he told me, "No, I'm, it, it's Ramadan and, and all that, and it's not what he does." And like, oh, I know that's that's kind of the gag. That's kind of the gag, you know. But there you go. Anyway, I am going to disappear. I'm got I've got things to do, places to go, people to see, and uh, yeah, it's been enjoyable. It's been emotional. Hopefully, I'm wrong. Hopefully, it's nowhere near a four nil defeat. Hopefully, a couple of you guys that have said we can get a draw are on the money. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, one other thing. Uh, I am supporting Food Bank, and I'll play the promo in a minute. Please um, feel obliged if you could feel um, your way clear to, to giving yourself, giving them a li little uh, chunk of change in your pocket. If you've got any change, sort of like if you've got someone there with a bucket, I believe... I believe there might be another location or two. If things go according to plan, my understanding is that if anybody is in the vicinity of Hackney Wick, where the rib man normally rocks up, my understanding is, is that there might be someone there with a bucket. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So if any of you are in that vicinity, please feel free to drop some change in the bucket and uh, treat yourself to a rib roll, which I can heartily recommend. Uh, take care, Walshy. And uh, yeah, no problem, Joan. You're always more than welcome. Right. OK, that's me done. I'm going to play the Iron Supporting Food Bank promo and then I'm going to hightail it out of here. Have yourself a great day. Come on, you Irons. You might have to take an umbrella with you and uh, we'll see you for the match review, which will be sometime on Monday. Uh, that might have to be run by Duke because I might not be around. I might have other things that are going on, but we'll we'll sort something out. Anyway, look after you guys. See you soon. Forge from Iron is proud to support Iron Supporting Food Banks. They are a group of West Ham United fans and friends inspired by the work of other football fan food banks around the country. They collect food and cash donations from Newham Food Bank in Beckton who supply seven distribution centres in the borough, seven days a week, and hand out several hundred three-day emergency food packs every month to families in need. They are also working with other groups to improve conditions for vulnerable adults and children in the Newham community. They are supported in their efforts by West Ham United Football Club, the WHU Foundation, LS185, London Legacy Development Corporation, Newham Council, the Met Police, Spire London East Hospital, Expedient Security, and a large number of West Ham and football fans. You can help by making a donation to their Just Giving page. You will find the link to this in the description section of the video details in this stream. Thank you for your support. Come on, you irons.